Choosing a tripod for photography seems like it would be simple, but if you're shopping for a new tripod and you find yourself overwhelmed by the endless options, wide-ranging prices, and daunting number of head and legs combinations on the market, then you're in the right place. Matt Anderson here from Viewfinder Mastery, where we give you the training, the support, and the inspiration to take your photography further. Today, we're talking about how to choose a tripod. There are so many options when it comes to buying a new tripod, and in this video, I'm gonna help you understand what kinds of specifications to look for before you spend your hard-earned money on that new set of sticks. I've owned a lot of different tripods and tripod heads over the years, but they haven't all performed equally. To help you avoid the dreaded newbie tax, I'm gonna walk you through the kinds of things that I would look for when buying a new set of tripod legs so that you can purchase yours with confidence. While this video is not a product review, I will share each of the models in my own quiver and explain how I ended up choosing them for my own photography needs. Hopefully, this will help you make an informed decision about which tripod is best for you. By the way, don't miss out on my bonus tip about choosing the very best tripod plates for safely and easily connecting your camera to your tripod head. There's some valuable information which could save you from some serious buyer's remorse. And while you're watching, let us know what kind of photography you'll be doing with your new tripod. Or if you already own a tripod, let us know which model you're currently using and whether it's working out well or not. It's always interesting to hear about the experiences others are having with their gear and your input may help others choose wisely in their own search. Okay, there are a few key questions that I'd like to orient you to, which I think will help your understanding of your own tripod needs. They have to do with size and weight, materials and design, and finally, what type of head you'll be attaching to the top of it, which depends a lot on the type of photography that you like to do. Purchasing any tripod is going to force you towards a compromise between affordability, weight, strength and versatility. Sounds more complicated than it really is. First is the question of whether you're interested in a smaller, lighter tripod, a larger, heavy-duty tripod, or a mid-size split-the-difference model. Most people will start with the question of size, understandably, because up until now, they may have been avoiding tripods and carrying this thing around already sounds like a pain in the butt but I'll explain in a moment why I think focusing on size and weight is not the right place to start. Besides size and weight, cost is usually the next consideration. Of course, if the tripod you really wanna buy is currently unaffordable, it may be worth saving your cash and postponing the purchase. This may turn out to be cheaper in the long run since you'll be avoiding the dreaded double purchase or newbie tax as we sometimes call it. Yes, you pay for what you get, but stick around to find out which specific models I've really enjoyed using and why, which I'm gonna share with you in just a moment. When it comes to choosing the best tripod for your photography, here's the three things that I suggest you think about. Your personal height, your subject's height, and what type of gear you're going to be shooting with. Your height is a fundamentally important thing because it doesn't make a lot of sense for a very tall photographer to use a very short tripod unless she or he wants back problems or enjoys kneeling behind the camera for some weird reason. Rest assured that there are great tripods of all heights out there on the market, and your goal should be to find one that puts your camera at a standing eye-level height without the need to crouch down and without needing to extend a center column to achieve this height. Allow me to explain why. Okay, one of the best reasons to get a tripod is so that you can experiment with the fascinating world of long exposure photography. And there's often lots of great opportunities for this type of thing when you're shooting landscapes. To achieve this blurring movement effect, for example, in the water, while also keeping the foreground elements pin sharp, you'll need to really avoid vibrating the tripod at all during your exposure. Extending a tripod's center column leads to increased vibration problems, especially when shooting in windy conditions, and keeping that center column lowered provides a surprising sharpness advantage. So pay attention to a tripod's maximum height measurement both with and without the center column extended. Center columns are a hot debate among photographers, and I can't really vote for or against them. 
What I do appreciate though is a center column that can easily be removed in the field without any special tools. If I can invert the column, then that's even better because shooting with the camera suspended underneath the tripod is a great way to achieve some very dynamic, low down perspectives and even suspend the camera in positions that wouldn't be possible with the center column in the normal upward orientation. This is a feature which is really worth looking for. I assume that most photographers watching this video will be interested in shooting a wide range of subjects, which as a photography teacher is definitely my case as well. When it comes to height, you'll want to imagine yourself shooting a number of different subjects before deciding how high is high enough. Here's a few height scenarios to think about. If one of your motivations for buying a tripod is to get sharper close-up or macro photos, then you're definitely on the right track. Getting your camera into a very low position could be very relevant, especially if you enjoy shooting insects or low flowers. Not all tripods can get your camera into a super low position, and you'll want to avoid buying a tripod which has a non-removable center column, since that would block you from getting the tripod down to a worm's eye perspective. If you like shooting birds like I do, and you wish to get sharper, cleaner images by stabilizing your gear and using lower ISO settings, then make sure your tripod is tall enough to angle upward without needing to crouch down uncomfortably to see through your camera's viewfinder. While I never shoot straight up at birds, most of the time they are perched at least slightly above me, requiring that the camera be aimed upward a bit. A comfortable shooting position is key to being patient when it comes to wildlife, and a strained back would really sap my concentration and lead me to miss a lot of shots. Again, a raised center column will impact your stability, especially with a heavy telephoto lens. So for long lens photography, I never extend my center column, and I actually prefer to work with a heavier duty, columnless tripod. You may find yourself shooting still life subjects from a tripod, just because it's easier to set things up and keep the camera in a fixed position while making changes to the arrangement, the light, and to your camera settings. In this scenario, long exposure times are less common, and I do find a center column very handy for making quick adjustments to the camera's height without needing to adjust all three legs of the tripod. This convenience is the center column's main advantage. It's worth noting that some center columns can be extended sideways from the apex of the tripod as well. Stability is definitely compromised in this case, but for photographers who need to get the camera suspended directly over a table to do food photography, for example, this feature could be very handy. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand why you don't wanna put thousands of dollars worth of expensive camera gear on top of a flimsy tripod. So bear in mind that as your photography advances and your equipment becomes more sophisticated, you'll want a more reassuring set of legs underneath it. All tripods have weight ratings that describe the heaviest load that they're designed to safely support. If you can't find that information for the tripod in question, then move on to another make or model. Err on the conservative side with this rating, since some companies flatter themselves with less than realistic specifications. I prefer to think about my worst case scenario. That is, my heaviest lens with my heaviest camera with a flash and any other accessories. Then I multiply that weight by two. The reason is that I've often been in situations where the wind was blowing very hard and I had to suspend additional ballast weight under my tripod or apply downward pressure with my hand just to keep the whole rig from blowing over in the wind. This is especially true when you're doing landscape photography in coastal locations with big wind catching filters attached to your lens. Don't underestimate how challenging the wind can be if you're getting into landscape photography. At times like these, I really don't mind if my tripod weighs a little bit more. Lightweight travel tripods are all the rage these days and it's no wonder why, but let's be realistic. If you're shooting with a phone or a compact camera, they're awesome. I love my little Sirui T025X, which weighs about a pound and packs up really small. This is my go-to tripod if I'm hiking or biking a long distance and taking it along to support a compact camera or a smartphone. Mine has a removable center column, which I usually have removed to reduce weight and increase the stability. But that column gives it some respectable height for other uses as well. 
I'll sometimes use this one for supporting a microphone, when recording ambient sound, or when doing voiceovers from a standing position like this. It's really handy, but I would never put my full-sized expensive gear on top of it. It would end in tears, guaranteed. That brings me to my next tripod, which is my mid-size Gitzo Traveler GT2545T. As the name implies, this tripod travels very well since it folds back against itself, like my Siroe does as well, and it fits into any carry-on luggage very easily. I've taken this tripod all over the world, and despite being relatively lightweight, it's sturdy enough to support all but my heaviest camera and lens combination. If I'm doing landscape photography with a wide or medium length lens, which is usually the case, then it's perfectly adequate. I even feel confident putting my 70 to 200 millimeter 2.8 lens on top of this tripod. I love how versatile it is and the removable center column can easily be inverted with no special tools whatsoever. I get a lot of use out of this one and I really enjoy using it in all but the most demanding situations. When it comes to long lens shooting, in my case, bird photography or any other wildlife type situation, or when I'm shooting video, I reach for the heavy duty tripod. It's rated to over 35 pounds of camera gear, which is more than twice as heavy as my longest lens with my camera and battery pack and even with a flash mounted on top. As far as heavy duty tripods go, this is one of the lightest models that I could find. I'm an ounce counter when it comes to equipment since I'm often putting it in a backpack and hiking long distances through difficult terrain to do my photography. My Leo Photo LS324 CEX has the height to bring my camera to eye level without using a center column, even when angling slightly upwards. The extra height is super handy when shooting upward at birds and other subjects or while working on a steep hillside. But the one super awesome feature that this tripod came with, which really put it in another league, is the built-in half ball for leveling the top platform. This feature allows me to quickly level off the top platform regardless of whether the ground underneath me is level or not. I can't overstate how useful this feature is, especially for doing video work or panorama photography. You can make yourself crazy adjusting your legs to get the camera perfectly level, but it takes less than five seconds with this handy built-in half ball feature. On most larger systematic tripods, you'll need to purchase a bowl and a leveling ball separately. So finding a tripod that came with this is also lightweight and reaches my standing eye level without any center column did take a bit of research. Speaking of the half ball, another feature that I really appreciate are the set screws that help bind the tripod head to the apex of the tripod legs. By twisting these set screws into position, it's impossible to accidentally loosen the head, which would otherwise just be screwed on to the stud that sticks out of the tripod's apex. I wish my Gitzo had this feature. This is a small detail, which adds significant peace of mind, especially when using heavier equipment. Here's a couple other things that I really appreciate about a well-designed tripod. But before I go there, could you do me a little favor, please, and subscribe to our channel? We'd really be psyched to have you on board, and it just makes producing these videos so much more enjoyable having that support from you. We share lots of helpful tips, so by subscribing, you won't miss out on the next one. Okay, as I was saying, there's a few other things that really elevate a good tripod to a great one. Let's start with the legs themselves. Leg diameter plays a big role in the strength ratings, but it also has an impact on vibration absorption. Don't expect fat tubing on an ultra compact tripod, but on the heavy duty models, it's a must have. I'm also a sucker for carbon fiber legs, which is the lightest material out there. It's also the most expensive in comparison to aluminum. I don't really know why anybody would bother with a wood tripod apart from nostalgia, but no matter how cool they look, the extra weight would be a no-go for me. Besides being lightweight, carbon fiber also absorbs vibration better than aluminum will. If weight is less critical, and if you wanna save a few bucks, aluminum is not a bad way to go. And for what it's worth, my first tripod certainly was an aluminum one, and it's still holding up decades later. You'll see a lot of three and four section tripod legs out there. The basic thinking is that three section models offer the best rigidity. However, they don't usually pack down as compactly as four section tripods do. Five section tripods can be very compact, 
but they compromise stability even more. I use a five section travel tripod, but I would never choose a five section tripod as my main workhorse. In fact, the absolute heaviest camera I would even think about putting on my ultralight Sirui is a lightweight mirrorless body with a very lightweight fixed lens like this. Frankly, this is pushing the limit and I'm certainly going to need to remove the center column for added stability. Leg locks are also a source of debate among photographers and there are two basic types. You have the twist locks like you see on all of my tripods here and the lever or latch style are also common. It's a matter of preference really and both work great. I've just found that the twist locks slip into the side pockets of my backpack nicely and they don't get caught on things in my duffel bag as easily as the latches do. But I have friends who swear by the latch style closures, horses for courses I guess. The feet of a tripod are also important and you'll notice that most high-end tripods have removable feet. This is handy for two reasons. First, you want to be able to replace them if they wear out and secondly, it's sometimes nice to use spikes instead of rubber nubs, especially if you're on a grassy hillside, frosty or icy terrain, or basically anywhere where a sharp spike can help you get a little extra purchase. This is usually something that you have to buy separately. Combination feet aren't my favorite because I find that the spikes are rarely aggressive enough and are usually a bit too short to be useful when it actually counts. Moving to the top of the tripod, or the apex as it's called, I already mentioned the set screws, which are nice to have even if you don't have a half ball built in, but another thing to check out are these angle stops. This refers to the ratcheting mechanism that allows you to click your tripod's legs into different angle positions according to the terrain where you're set up. Ideally, three different angles should be possible. One of my complaints about my Gitzo Traveler is that it only has two. I make it work, but every so often I wish that I had a third setting especially when shooting along a rocky shore, among slippery boulders, or along the edge of a stream where space is tight and balancing is tricky. Now imagine yourself operating this angle stop mechanism in the cold with gloves on. It shouldn't be pinching you or causing you a lot of frustration. There's simply too many good tripods out there to tolerate that kind of thing. I'm a big fan of these magnetic angle stops on my Leo photo with their nice wide wings that are easy to pull out even with gloves on. They're a little bit noisier than some others, but there's no way that I'm gonna pinch myself and I won't need to remove a glove to adjust them. Might seem trivial, but believe me, if you enjoy shooting in colder environments like I do, then this is not an insignificant thing. Okay, if you've made it this far, that's amazing. So do go ahead and hit that like button for us, please. And don't forget to subscribe since we've got lots of other great tips to share with you. Don't miss out. Okay, on to tripod heads. Tripod heads could be a whole video unto itself, of course. The deep dive will have to come in another video, but for now, what I wanna help you with are a few guiding principles when picking out a head for your new tripod legs. Without a tripod head, your tripod is basically useless. So with that obvious fact out of the way, let's get into a few details. Okay, for starters, if you're in the market for an inexpensive tripod, either a smaller or a mid-size model, then you may find some attractive offers for tripod and head combinations. This was the case for both my lightweight tripod from Sirui and was also the case for my mid-size Gitzo Traveler. The advantage of buying them together is that you know that they'll be appropriately sized and that you won't be mismatching a super powerful head with some wimpy legs or vice versa. You may also get a good deal since the whole kit may be on sale and saving a little cash never hurts. I would say that as long as you're buying a simple ball head, that might work out well for you. If, however, you're wanting to get into a more sophisticated head, and I'll show you one in just a second, then you're better off just buying the legs and the head separately. Okay, so why would you want anything other than a good old ball head atop your tripod? Ball heads are great. I have three of them. They're the simplest to use, they're versatile, they're relatively compact, and they're offered in all different sizes, strengths, and price points. Open the knob, adjust your composition, lock it down, and shoot. Super easy. Ball heads are certainly the most commonly used among photographers due to their simplicity and ease of use. Videographers, on the other hand, will be better off using a fluid head, which allows for nice, smooth movements of the camera while recording video. The internals are very different, and these are the models that come 
with handles to help you move the camera left to right and top to bottom in a nice smooth arc. Trying to do this with a ball head is just impossible and your footage will be causing mild nausea at best. If panoramas are your thing, you can't do better than a panoramic head. This is a pretty niche piece of gear, but it's also very versatile. A panoramic head allows you to position the camera behind the apex of the tripod with the lens centered directly over the tripod's pivot point in its nodal position. This provides the greatest accuracy when it comes to stitching images together in single or multi-row panoramas, which are really a lot of fun. That actually wouldn't be enough reason for me to buy a panoramic head, but this one is very strong and also does a perfect job of supporting my longest lens without flopping over like a ball head would. I can open the up-down action separately from the left to right action, or I can open both at the same time. It's just perfect for shooting birds and other wildlife from a tripod. It can also achieve all of the same things that a ball head can do if it's used in combination with a leveling base like I have on this tripod. Without the leveling base, you wouldn't be able to adjust for a level horizon. Its open frame is very lightweight, under one pound, and since it's just an open hinge, it's bomb-proof and it works flawlessly in very cold conditions where some ball heads can encounter trouble. I just love this thing. Three-way heads are a great way to go if you want to have very individual control over your left-to-right pan, your top-to-bottom tilt, and your left-to-right lean, adjusting each of them individually. I've never had a need for this type of head myself, but architectural shooters and even some landscape photographers prefer the finer adjustment and the individual control that these tripod heads give you. Finally, the geared head is another variation of the three-way head and allows very precise movements, even while supporting very heavy cameras. Geared heads have knobs that allow you to make micro adjustments to the camera's position across the three different axes individually. These are generally very expensive heads and are really only applicable if you're using a seriously heavy-duty kit. They're heavy and they're complicated, but I'm not bashing them. My friend Andrew, who works with large format cameras, swears by his geared head. But basically, you'll know who you are if you're in need of a geared head. All right, we've covered a lot of ground and I have a bonus tip coming for you right after our summary here, so let's just sum up what we've gone over. The first thing is to take your own height into consideration. How high does your tripod need to be if you wanna shoot comfortably from a standing position, preferably without using the center column extended? And how low can you get your tripod if you want to shoot subjects that are near to the ground? What is your worst scenario in terms of the heaviest combination of camera, lens, and flash or other accessories that you could imagine perching on top of your tripod? Double that weight for the strength rating that you should be looking for. Okay, on to a few of the finer points. Choose the number of leg sections to balance your need for portability versus stability. In most cases, this will be a choice between four sections or three. Do you prefer twist locks or will flip locks do the trick? Will you go for carbon fiber or aluminum to save a few bucks? What about removable feet? Do you wanna have set screws in the top of the tripod for securing your head? Finally, we have the head itself. Is a ball head gonna do the trick for you or do you anticipate shooting with a long telephoto lens? Are panoramas interesting for you? What about video? There are so many models on the market, so take your time and don't be satisfied until you've checked all the boxes. By the way, the tripod which is perfect for me may not be perfect for you, so recognize that it's a very individualized purchase. Okay, here's your bonus tip. It has to do with camera plates. Most tripod heads will have some kind of plate that remains on the camera and a clamp of some kind on top of the tripod head. These plates are great because they allow you to quickly secure and remove your camera when setting up or breaking down. However, not all plates are created equally. My strong recommendation is to get a tripod that accepts plates which are Arca Swiss compatible. Arca Swiss is a company that makes very high quality tripod accessories and long ago they created the industry standard dovetail plate which is compatible with the greatest number of tripod accessories on the market today. If your camera's plate is not compatible with Arca Swiss, then it may be a struggle to find accessories later on as your needs become more advanced. Okay, if you're still with me at this point, that is amazing. If you've got questions, 
please leave them down in the comments below. I've got links to all of the gear that's been shown in this video in the description notes. And if you found that helpful and if you'd like more tips on equipment, then check out our free PDF download on my top 10 photography purchases to help you accelerate your photography learning. It's over at viewfindermastery.com. Thanks a lot for watching, happy shooting, and we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye for now. Hopefully you found that tip useful, and if you did, we'd really appreciate if you gave us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and do turn on notifications so that you don't miss our next helpful photography tip. Thanks for watching.